it's a very limited natural resource and from a strictly rancher's perspective you know the the amount of water you have directly influences how many cattle you can overwinter because of how much hay you can produce with it it's a right that belongs to the land and if you don't use your water right you could stand to lose it but it it does directly translate to our livelihood in in the ranching business i think you know it was you had to irrigate and i didn't know anything about irrigating and i remember walking down to the pond and i was like gosh it's so wet down there what's the deal <laughs> and but but i think kurt knew that you had to have a certain amount of water to make your hay crop successful and so he got real involved in that and then he would as he learned the system um he saw that sometimes you weren't getting all your water and sometimes you were and it was sort of a sometimes a struggle the ranchers only really have three months to irrigate for the more senior rights and really only a month for the junior water rights so that means that there's an added a onus on the ranchers to ensure that they get at least their one hay crop out a year because second cuts aren't possible with the amount of water we have. And so that's also one of the sources of tension is that everything relies on one cut of hay every year. It's just amazing that this water is very important to these people's livelihoods. It's very important. And, and it is worth fighting over. I mean, it's, it's very important. So try to keep some calm <laughs> through the whole thing. Yeah, my name is Michael Condit. Uh, uh, my family ranch was uh, homesteaded in 1884 and we've got water rights from territorial days clear up to the 1960s. And we have water rights in uh, Brush Creek drainage, El Calo Creek drainage, and the Cedar Creek drainage, and part points in between that we share with all of our neighbors. Before the the program that we have going on now, we we spent more time fighting with each other and threatening lawsuits and arguing than we did actually irrigating with water once we once we had it and. In most cases, we really didn't have any way to, to know whether the water we were fighting over was even what we belonged to, who we thought it belonged to. Uh, we had no way to determine a priority in any of the extremes. And frankly, the, the state had no way of determining a priority in any of the streams, um, let alone any, any ability to, to actually administer it if we knew what that priority was. So for the first couple of years, uh, when Justin Stone was the student working on the system. It was a very steep learning curve, both for him and the ranchers, in order to go from this paper model to a real world model. And it turned out quite well for Justin, and he was then able to take that knowledge and apply it in his new position as the local state hydrographer working for the state engineer's office. At a certain point, Kurt decided to research the water rights and hired Jeb Stewart to do that. And Jeb put together a book that is really hard for me personally to read because I don't understand it that well. Um, but Jeb put together this book for Kurt and, uh, and Kurt was a little annoyed with the local uh, state engineer's office because he did not feel like the water rights were being apply properly. This area was described as one of the uh, most contentious areas in the whole state uh, for administration of these water rights. Fair to say, even with state help, uh, people still did not get along and there were, there were problems. I think there's like 16 different ranches or something like that. And not everybody likes each other. <laughs> there's, there's, um, you know, uh, generations old family feuds in the group and, and um, other hard feelings from, from way back when. And, 
It's always surprised me that this group of people has been willing to continue to meet, even though sometimes we couldn't even agree on the color of the sky. And so uh, I think that it got to the point where everyone was so sick and tired of the endless conflict that they were ready for, for some kind of a attempt at, at doing something different. About 10 years ago, the governor's office approached Scott Miller about working on this project to help a group of ranchers with their self-administration in the Brush Creek system. And so for the past five years, I've been working on that project. And then before me, there were a couple of other students who also participated in it. The general idea is to provide administration during the summer to provide an impartial voice at the table when discussing irrigation matters. And so our main roles are ensuring that each person has the correct amount of water. And in order to do that, we have to start by predicting each day how much of the water is supposed to go in which ditch. And we then spend the rest of the day going around the system, trying to match flows as closely as possible to the predictions. For the research that I did initially found most of the uh, permits from a, a tributary called North French Creek <coughs> brought water from uh, North French Creek across the divide into its trans basin diversion into the Brush Creek drainage. All of those early water rights, uh, senior to 1945, had a condition stipulation attached to their certificates that there was uh, they would bring it over and that water would stay in a creek, Barrett Creek, and then an equal amount would then be taken out of a different creek, North Brush Creek. Well, that, uh, the exact interpretation of that exchange in lieu agreement was not being implemented at the time. Well, we're here at the head of the French ditch, which is bringing in French Creek water, which is part of the exchange and what we're trying to do is understand the travel time from here down to the Barrett recorder and we do that using a fluorescent tracer dye called rhodamine WT. It's a non-toxic dye that requires only very small amounts to then be detectable at the downstream end and from that you can imagine it like it being a packet of water that we have tagged and we can then see how long it takes for that packet of water to arrive at the bottom of the system. By doing this at multiple flows, so different levels in the creek, we're able to build a relationship between the water at the top end and when it arrives at the bottom end. And from that, we can then use that model to predict water arriving at the Barrett recorder based on the flows at the French ditch recorder in like the two to eight hours beforehand, depending on the flows. And that then directly feeds into our predictions of water rights because we're able to more accurately represent the imported water and thus not negatively affect the native water and ensure that those importing water are getting all of the water that is owed to them. What was found initially that much was not understood how, how this all should work. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, we have a lot of imported water from other drainages. That water would come into the system and disappear. Nobody knew where it went. Uh, we found that there were times uh, some people were getting more than they were supposed to and some people weren't getting any and nobody understood it. So at the time I came on to help these guys, what the timing of that coincided with uh, the, the breaking up of what was once a very large ranch here, where we're standing, uh, it included lots more acres under one ownership than it does now. So it was split three different ways uh, within the family. So even the family members found uh, they weren't getting the water they thought they used to get or should be getting. And 
so there was just a lot of work to to do in that regard. I and uh, my ranch manager, Bill Clay, decided to share the book with the state engineer's office. And then we told the other members of our drainage of our system that if they wanted to copy the book, if they wanted to take it down to the um, print shop, they could have it printed. And it was a pretty significant book. And so everyone got a copy because we kind of, Bill and I felt that the more everyone had the same information, the better we would if we could all get on the same page. And so we went through several meetings and we, you know, were contacting the governor and I think our, our squeaky wheel squeaked loud enough that the governor thought something should be done about it. Our group started talking and we started not fighting, but we started discussing and having reasonable discussions and and, and not to say it wasn't a little tense at first, but I, we've come such a long way in the last, what, 10 years that, it, that it's amazing that, that we've, we've done this. And, and this year in particular is an extremely dry year. And I don't think people are fighting and stealing water. They're talking about things before they make a move. But we have an administrator and we have people who help us. That's sort of a, they don't have a dog in the hunt. They're just doing a job to help us. And that, that really is helpful. So the university has developed over the years quite a pool of technology. And um, partly thanks to a grant that Scott Miller was part of roughly 10 years ago. So about when this project was starting called the YKEG project, which was an NSF funded multi-million dollar um, capacity building grant and so that has allowed the shell lab which is the hydrology lab that Scott is part of to have a lot of equipment and tools available that we can then apply in the system to help the ranchers with irrigation knowledge and administration. In Jeb's original book there was a paper method for going through and calculating the priority for all the ditches but it's quite a time intensive process. And so we've been working on developing a computer model that does the same process basically. But instead of taking several hours, it does it in mere seconds. And eventually that may have the possibility of us having the calculations done online and updating throughout the day the priority for the system. When we started this, it was easy to find help with uh, you know, having a headgate designed, having a measuring device uh, installed, but no one wanted to touch administration. <clears throat> and that was the key, you know, until we had someone that was willing to step up and try to make sense of the system as a whole, it just, it didn't change anything. It's, it's all dependent on people's willingness to continue to participate. Uh, I think so far everyone Everyone is, is very pleased with it um, because it's, a, like I said, some kind of a, you can find an answer. You know, before we just argued endlessly for no, <laughs> and there was no solution in sight. So what happened, we, we ended up changing a lot of those historic practices to, you know, just deliver the water the best way possible, had the highest use, efficiency. And it basically kind of turned the clock back to probably how it was run. It's all about the chemistry of the people in the group. It really is. You can't, you can't f force any of it on anyone. Um, people, people are so used to, to practically going to war for their water rights with their neighbors that it's really hard to, to, to break that. This vision relies on cooperation with all the local state engineers offices because the point is not to replace them in any way but just to help the ranchers with their self-administration to reduce the number of times that the state engineer has to be called in in an enforcement capacity and that helps foster a relationship of cooperation where rather than spending their time on enforcement 
the local hydrographers have more time available to help the ranchers with measurements, understanding the system, and can help more with responding to queries and questions about water rights and water issues rather than intervening on the ground. When I start talking to other drainages, we find that appropriators say, well, you know, I like this part of what you're doing over there, but this other part, I don't want any part of that, which I struggle with because, uh, you know, my years in the legislature, the law is very important to me. And not that we do everything perfect here, but you know, we try. And to kind of pick and choose what law you want to, to follow and which ones you don't, it's, it's kind of, it conflicts with, with me. We had, you know, Mike Condit quietly led our meetings and it was, he was sort of a calming influence on the whole group and, and um, everyone seemed to kind of settle down and, and they all, it, it seems to have worked so much better. And I think we've become a model and I think, I think the other drainages in the, in the valley may be a little jealous of how well we, we do work because we didn't work well at all for so long. And I, I mean, it's just big change. Sometimes Jeb Stewart comes in and uh, volunteers his services to kind of mediate the group. He's been, you know, studying this for years and years. And so there's that. Sometimes, uh, sometimes we have to agree to disagree, but agree to continue working on a solution.